Ginger, you're listening to Live with Lou, and uh, today we're doing something a little bit different. I'm I'm pre-recording these intros, and I'm actually in Saigon or in Cambodia, either place, uh, and I wanted to introduce a couple items here today that, that we have some helpers with this show. Wikiman is here, Santos Vigil, but Chris Ann Hall is going to be participating, as well as Dinesh D'Souza with the magic of modern technology. So we're going to play some clips by them and introduce them. But uh, first of all, we're going to play a, a clip by Chris Ann Hall that talks about how she got fired uh, working for the uh, state government of Florida by just having uh, giving a speech, and she got canned. So uh, we're also going to talk about today about... Uh, the 14th Amendment, which talks about the, the proverbial anchor babies, or like what the 14th Amendment meant uh, regarding making slaves citizens, as member slaves weren't citizens. They're going to talk about that. So Chris, on, Chris Ann Hall is going to get a, a, the lion's share of the show today. Uh, she very graciously agreed to fill in for me. And then also there's a great clip by Dinesh D'Souza. So I uh, hope you enjoy your day. Wikiman's got the controls, so here we go. Rise and shine, liberty-loving patriots. Chris Ann Hall here, K-R-I-S-A-N-N-E-H-A-L-L.com. Liberty over security, principle over party, and truth over your favorite personality. Welcome. I am so excited to be here. I just, you know, I love what I do. It's so awesome. And I want to remind those of you who are listening to the radio show, that you can now watch the Chris Ann Hall Show on the Lifestyles channel of the Christian Television Network. And I want to show you how to do that. All you have to do is go to my website, chrisannhall.com, click on the Chris Ann Hall Show television tab, and then you can find out how you can either live stream on your computer or you can uh, watch it on your television where available. I will show you how to do that on my website, chrisannhall.com. Please know that I have a radio show that I am doing five days a week. The television viewers only get to see one of those shows once a week. And you can watch, you could go and listen to all five of these shows by simply going to my website and clicking on the tab that says the Chris Ann Hall Show. You will pull up all the archives we are a liberty over security principle over party truth over your favorite personality radio show I am NOT uh, screaming and yelling you know you see me now uh, pointing fingers and laying blame I believe losers point fingers and winners find solutions and that's what we're all about here on the Chris Ann Hall show bringing you contemporary issues and pointing you in the direction of the constitutional solutions to the problems that our politicians and errant government have created that should never be so and in light of that I want to share something with you a bit of an anniversary if we can you see, about six years ago, I gave a speech that got me fired. Now, I had no idea when I stood up and gave this speech that, that the turmoil that I would be unleashing. But I want to share that speech with you today and let you decide whether I should have been fired for this. If this is such a controversial thing, I want to share with you the passion of my heart that birthed this Liberty First movement. And I'd like to speak to you today on the subject of informing ourselves. Thomas Jefferson warned that if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. We've enjoyed the benefits left to us by previous generations. America's had the greatest medical system, the greatest technologies, the strongest military, and the greatest economy. However, our nation, as our nation has prospered, we've become distracted by our luxuries, busied in our labors, and lazy towards our liberties. We, we have allowed the enemies of freedom to worm their way into positions of power and influence. The Heritage Foundation says it like this, there is a widespread ignorance of American history. We face an education system that upholds mediocrity in the name of relativism, 
an ever-expanding and centralized government unmoored from constitutional limits, judges openly making laws and shaping society based on pop philosophy rather than serious jurisprudence. And at the root of all these problems is a pervasive ignorance about the core principles that define America and ought to inform our politics and our policy. You see, I agree with them. And that's why I believe the Tea Party movement, this liberty movement is so important and so encouraging. I'm actually encouraged that the movement is not a, a party at all. It is we the people. We the people founded this nation and I believe we the people, we will take it back. But we the people must also inform ourselves if we wish to take back our nation and ourselves and our, for ourselves and for our children. Notice that I didn't say we needed to be informed. Rather that we need to inform ourselves. Truth is power, and it's up to us to search out and secure the truth. The Bible says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If we arm ourselves with truth and act on that truth, we can be free from the bondage that ideological tyrants would desire to enslave us with. Patrick Henry said this in his famous speech, I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that's the lamp of experience. I know no way of judging the future but by the past. Patrick Henry's experience with heavy-handed government illuminated his understanding of the future. And if American liberty is to continue, we must inform ourselves and arm ourselves with the collective experiences of those that have come before. I want to mention four things as briefly as I can on the subject of informing ourselves. First, we the people must inform ourselves on core principles. A principle can be defined as a standard based upon truth and experience and which serves as a foundation which thought and action are built. A primary principle upon which this nation rests is constitutionalism. This is the understanding that the operation of our government and the security of our liberty are to be guided by our founding documents and interpreted according to our framers' intent. The Declaration and the Constitution have been relentlessly attacked in modern times. Our own president has implied that our Constitution's ideas are flawed. The professors in our law schools deride its relevance. Progressives would have it be as malleable as silly putty, but we the people recognize that the Declaration and the Constitution have served as the bedrock of our freedom for hundreds of years. And the genius with which our founders laid down the principles in these precious documents, I believe, can be only attributed to the providence of God. And we have a solemn duty to ourselves and our posterity to become informed in the core principles contained in our founding documents. Get yourself a copy of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Don't just read them. Study them. Research the history of how they came to be. Acquaint yourselves with men like John Leland and the Baptist Union of Virginia, without whom there would be no Bill of Rights. Read the wisdom of George Washington in his farewell address and be grounded in the experience of one of our nation's greatest heroes. We the people must know our core principles. Become not only grounded in them, but become their champions. Freedom of speech has no voice of its own, but it waits in silence for you to plead its case. The right to assemble will sit alone until you, ch its champion, gather in the face of despotism. Our forefathers cry out through the pages of history, but unheard until you give the written word, voice, and life. When our history is lost either through revision or apathy, then our liberty is lost as well. We, the people, must know our core principles and stand for them without wavering, for they are our liberty. The words of Patrick Henry still ring true 235 plus years later. Why stand we here idle? What is it the gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear and peace so sweet to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God, he said. I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty 
or give me death. Secondly, we the people must not only inform ourselves on core principles, we must inform ourselves about contrary principles. If our core principles serve to secure and maintain the liberty wish, we wish to enjoy, then it stands to reason that there are contrary principles that threaten that same liberty, and we must be able to identify these enemies of our liberty. Sun Tzu says in his Art of War, Know thine enemy is thyself. And we must always remember that our enemies are not people or parties, but freedom-destroying principles that they espouse. We must inform ourselves on the principles of progressivism, socialism, communism, and the mechanisms of these philosophies use, such as redistribution of wealth, centralization of power, progressive taxation, and restrictions on freedom of speech. Once we are informed on these principles, we will then recognize them. We must oppose them regardless of the party or personality attempting to employ them. I say again, we must not give a free pass because of personality or party affiliation. It's ironic that Teddy Roosevelt is heralded as a great hero of the Republican Party when in fact history testifies that he was the leader of the anti-constitutional progressives in 1912. He is also under the Republican Party that the refundable tax credit was enacted, allowing progressives to engage in redistribution of wealth and enslave citizens with the tax refund. Am I anti-Republican? No. But these enemies of our liberties entered in because we put party over principle. The president recently suggested that his program of socialized medicine was okay because Republican Mitt Romney proposed the same program. It's not wrong because of who proposed it. It's wrong because it's based on principles that are contrary to liberty. You would not allow anyone to feed your children rat poison, whether they give uh, the giver was Satan or Santa Claus. Progressivism, however, doesn't come in a bottle with a skull and crossbones. It shows up as something or someone who wants to help. And it will have a cute little, little name like Acorn. And it will talk about fairness and recovery, aid and stimulus, always sounding positive but underneath a deadly poison. Again, we must be grounded in our core principles, but we must be guarded against these contrary principles which poison our freedom and destroy our liberty. If you can't define liberty, you can't defend it. But if you can't define these contrary principles, you cannot defeat it either. And when we come back after this break, we will finish the speech that got me fired. We the people must not only inform ourselves about contrary principles, but we also must inform ourselves about candidates. We should now realize that a charismatic personality, eloquent speech making, and a catchy slogan do not a leader make. We must identify candidates who hold true to the right principles and who will not sacrifice those principles for politics or power. Some would say you must compromise if you hope to, wish, uh, or you hope to accomplish anything. Surely cooperation and negotiation are essential in government, but a principle, by its very definition, is not open for compromise, or it will be destroyed. If sound principles cause me to oppose a proposal, then an offer of money or jobs for my state should not change my position. Let's inform ourselves about candidates and issues and make an informed vote. And as I finish, I want to mention that we, the people, must inform ourselves about current events. You know, it's encouraging to see the awakening going on around America, I mean, even around the world. But the cynic in me says this, only someone who was sleeping needs an awakening. John Philpott Coran said, it is the common fate of the indolent to see their liberties stolen by the active. The condition upon which God grants liberty to man is eternal vigilance. And if that condition is broken, servitude is his punishment and the immediate indication of his guilt. We can't take time off. We can't stick our heads in the sand. We cannot even slumber for a moment. This movement can't simply be an awakening.
Once we've reclaimed our nation from the forces that would steer us away from our core principles, we must establish a lifestyle of liberty vigilance. We must stay informed and stay involved. We must go beyond the elections. We reach the beginning, the beginning of the revitalized and reconnected citizen government. Our cry must be this. We the people have awakened. We the people have informed ourselves and we the people will never sleep again. Thank you and God bless you. Now, <laughs> was that worthy of being fired? Or are those principles of truth? How, how, how long have we slumbered? How active are we in current events? How knowledgeable are we about what the Supreme Court is doing? How knowledgeable are we about what the executive branch is doing? How knowledgeable are we about what Congress should be doing? You see, voting does not secure your liberty once every four years, once every two years, is not eternal vigilance. The only security to your liberty is to make sure that you are governing your politicians all the time. We have been saying in the South, like white on rice. <laughs> you need to be on them like white on rice. No passes because they're your party guy. No passes because they have some kind of, of personality and you liked them or they're friendly or they're nice Christian guy or gal. It's time for us to get educated on these principles and really start, really start holding to them with no compromise. You see, as a Christian, I don't believe that I can vote the lesser of two evils. I believe that by voting the lesser of two evils, I dishonor God and ensure only that evil will always have its day. I also believe that all good things come from the Father above, which means that there's always a good choice. The only problem is, is because we are not eternally vigilant and we put all our eggs in an election basket, we have decided through primaries that good is no longer electable. See, our standard is not good. Our standard is not constitutionalism. Our standard is not the supreme law of the land or a moral standard. Our standard has become electability. And I believe Voting based on electability, setting aside principles and setting aside morals is an immoral behavior. If you want a moral government, we must become a moral people again. We must stand for our principles unwavering and uncompromising. Or there's really nothing worth standing for at all. I don't know if you have read my article on my website called connecting let's connect the dots of the ACA the Affordable Care Act but I find all of this so very disturbing because you see it's just unfolding right in front of our faces exactly how I thought it would not because I'm some genius or I'm a prophet or I'm some kind of soothsayer but because I know history. Remember, Patrick Henry said we can know our future by our history. I know history. I know government works. And I'm looking at this current federal government that we have, both Republicans and Democrats, and I am looking at it and seeing what a tyranny we've allowed to happen. You see, Congress has turned over its power to the executive, neutering themselves from oversight. And as a result, the Supreme Court is irrelevant when pointing out that constitutional boundaries have been, have been uh, overwhelmed because, you see, because Congress has failed to do their job. We have allowed our federal government as a whole to create a whole system alien to our Constitution, a system of government that is nowhere described or authorized 
by our Constitution, the framers, or the states who ratified it. Now this is the solution part, because this is what we're all about, is solutions. You see, there is no authority in the Constitution for the federal government to issue these regulations. And this is where the solution comes. It comes from the states. The states have got to stand and ignore these regulations and ignore the illegitimate structure which they, through the Constitution, gave no authority to create. If Congress will not dismantle the alien extra-constitutional system, the states must cease to legitimize this system and they must refuse to comply. Our state legislators and our governors must step up and say, you can write all the regulations that you want. You can inscribe them in stone and triplicate if you choose. But you have no authority for them. And we will not comply. Our states must force Congress into action by not participating in or complying with these illegitimate regulations and this illegitimate offspring of the executive branch and administrative government that they have created through the abdication and creation of unconstitutional power. How is it that the Congress can give so much power to the executive branch completely contrary to every bit of our Constitution and history. Do you know in 1688 our forefathers went to war over a king over these violations of separation of power? The king was James II and they said James II was completely destroying liberty by assuming and exercising a power of dispensing with and suspending of laws and the execution of laws without the consent of Parliament. This violation of separation of powers is an old tyrannical trick. And our solution is not the kingdom solution because the kingdom solution is violent revolution and chopping off heads. Our solution is the constitutional republic solution where the states stand up and refuse to comply. Jefferson said, when all government, domestic and foreign, in, as little, in, in little as and great things shall be drawn to Washington as the center of all power, it will render powerless the checks provided of one government on another. If the states look with apathy on the silent descent of their government into, into the gulf which it is to swallow all, we have only to weep over the human character formed uncontrollable by, but by a rod of iron. We have a government that is completely and totally out of control because we have states who, are, who will not control their creation. Jefferson said in 1791, it is important to strengthen the state governments as this cannot be done by any change in the federal constitution for the preservation of that is all we need to contend for. He said it must be done by the states themselves erecting such barriers at the constitutional line as cannot be surmounted by either themselves or by the general government. The only barrier in their power is a wise government. A weak one will lose ground in every contest. Our states must assume their strength in their independent and sovereign nature and stand up to the Congress and say, the president can write regulations, you can pass regulations, but you have no authority for them, so we will not comply. We're seeing a little bit of this awakening with the refugee status. There is no constitution. We've already taught this lesson. There is no constitutional status for the federal government to impose refugees on the states. That is not in the Constitution. And there is no constitutional authorization for the executive branch to issue over 2,000 regulations over things that ought not be regulated. It's time for us to stand up with our solutions. It's time for us to regain our power. It is time for we, the people, to inform ourselves and understand just how much power we have. It is time for us to stand up and push back and say we will not comply. Because you know what? Compliance is, is submitting to a slavery and a tyranny that will bind our children and make them fight.
talk about guns. Let's talk about guns, the Second Amendment, and a constitutional republic. Let's talk about the fact that we are acting like this is some kind of surprise. Like we shouldn't have been prepared for what's happening today. Like we shouldn't know that there's going to be some type of unconstitutional measure and some matter of resistance of the people, not against the taking of their guns, but a resistance of the people toward uh, people owning guns. Why should we be shocked and amazed that a large number of Americans are for some measure of, quote, gun control? Why should that surprise us? I, I don't know. Perhaps because we as a whole in America have developed a certain um, limited attention span. 140 characters or less, CNN headline news, and what the headline is today we forget tomorrow and uh, or 30 seconds later when the next tragedy comes up. Oh, we've got this crisis to go through. we got this uh, thing to deal with, and we, we are not a culture built on critical thinking, logic, and truth anymore. We're a culture built on emotion, built on crisis, built on whatever it takes to get us from this emotional high to the next emotional high. And so we continue to uh, consume all of this insane drama fed to us by the media, by the government, the government-controlled media, until we have nothing left in our lives of critical thinking, logic, and truth. So guns, is a very, guns are a very, very emotional topic today. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. Because that's the way we've been conditioned for quite some time. I'm going to play you a quick clip from Eric Holder from many years ago. Many years ago. I'm talking 1995. Okay, Obama is not even in office. Eric Holder has quite a history. I, I don't think people understand the history of Eric Holder. Do, do we remember that Ronald Reagan, in 1988, appointed Eric Holder to serve as a judge of the Superior Court of the District of Columbia? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan appointed Eric Holder, the district judge of the Superior Court of, Dis of, of the District of Columbia, knowing, had to know, that Eric Holder uh, was a member in, in Columbia, he went to Columbia University, uh, a member of the Student Afro-American Society, which staged an occupation of the ROTC lounge, demanding that the ROTC lounge be renamed the Malcolm X Lounge. Okay, That is not something that was hidden from the government when Ronald Reagan appointed Holder to serve as a judge of the Superior Court of the District of Columbia. Eric Holder stepped down from that position in 1993 to an accept an appointment as United States Attorney for the District of Columbia as uh, appointed by Bill Clinton. So while... U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, Eric Holder, in 1995, says this. Uh, I've also asked the school board to make a part of every day some kind of anti-violence, anti-gun message. Every day, every school, at every level. One thing that I think is clear with young people and with adults as well is that we just have to be repetitive about this. It's not enough to simply have a, a catchy ad on a Monday and then only do it every Monday. We need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. America, you have been brainwashed. You've absolutely been brainwashed. 
And since before 1995, I'll mind you, because the government never comes out and actually says anything in public that it hasn't already been doing. Since before 1995, we have had a government campaign to make Americans think differently about guns. So why are we surprised to know that a large number of people in America, I would even suggest to you that people that identify themselves as conservatives believe that there should be some measure of federal government gun control because we've been brainwashed. I'm here to tell you that there is no justification for any measure of federal gun control. Any measure of federal gun control whatsoever. There's not even any call for it. There's not even any authorization for it. And as a matter of fact, not only does the Constitution not authorize the federal government to engage in gun control measures, the Constitution absolutely prohibits federal gun control measures. Now, we're not going to get into state control measures today. That's a whole new can of worms. We're going to stick here with federal gun control. Because the issue here is this somehow this assumption that the President of the United States can unilaterally engage in gun control. Now, this shouldn't be some mystery that Obama believes that he can do this. I mean, he, Obama has been the most transparent president that we have had in decades. I mean, think about that. Ronald Reagan appointed Eric Holder. Is that something you would have expected from Ronald Reagan? But Barack Obama has been exactly who he says he was, exactly who he says he's going to be, and done exactly what he said he's going to do. Listen, listen, to, this, listen to this prediction from Barack Obama made several years ago. My understanding is the vice president is going to uh, provide a, a range of steps that we can take to reduce gun violence. Some of them will require legislation. Some of them uh, I can accomplish through executive action. But I'm confident that there are some steps that we can take that don't require legislation uh, and that are, are within my authority as president. Uh, and uh, where you get a step that uh, has the opportunity to reduce the, the possibility of gun violence, uh, then I want to go ahead and take it. <laughs> there are so many things wrong with that statement. First off, we're going to trust uh, the vice president. We're going to trust Biden to come up with some kind of measures. I mean, seriously. Biden can't come up with a measure to to find his own underwear in the morning, I bet. I, I, how are we going to uh, trust Biden to come up with some real legal measures here for gun control? And then we have the President of the United States claiming that he is certain that there is an authority that he has to create some kind of control over the people outside of legislation. Anybody ever heard of legislation without representation? That's exactly why our framers went to war. I mean, real-life war with their own government. And he's confident that the president has a power beyond legislation through Congress. Okay, let's just be, let's just be perfectly clear here. The president has no power to create law or regulation via the Constitution beyond Congress. And Congress has no authority to create laws to restrict, restrain, or prevent gun ownership. Congress doesn't even have that power. And if the legislation uh, cannot be created by Congress, then it certainly cannot be created by the President of the United States.
And here's the problem. The problem is we have been brainwashed for decades. The problem is we have not been teaching the Constitution properly for a century. The problem is we don't understand the limitations of the government. We don't understand the purpose of the Second Amendment. And we don't understand that the government has no authority to infringe upon our rights, our right to keep and bear arms, our inalienable right to keep and bear arms. And so today, I want to address this passionately, mind you, but without emotion, with clear fact, history, and real law, critical thinking in understanding what it means to have a right to keep and bear arms. A well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So if we're going to understand the Second Amendment, we need to answer two very, very important questions. Who are the militia? And what is a free state? Because without understanding those two terms, then the government can come along with their brainwashing and make us believe that it's not an individual right. And then it's not a right that is hinging upon the security of a free state. And so what I'd like to do in the manner in which I teach is bring to you the words of the men who wrote the document, who debated the document, and ratified the document into law. Not just any law, mind you, but the supreme law of the land. And we're going to begin with George Mason. Now, George Mason, we refer to George Mason as the father of the Constitution. And in 1788, George Mason said, 40 years ago, so do the math, 1788, 40 years ago, 1748, okay? So in 1788, George Mason said, 40 years ago, when the resolution of enslaving America was formed in Great Britain, the British Parliament was advised by an artful man who was governor of Pennsylvania. Now we have to remember, in the American colonies, the governors were not elected by the people, they were appointed by the king, because they didn't have that type of self-governance in a kingdom. The king appointed the governors. And apparently this governor of Pennsylvania in 1748 is a loyalist to the king and isn't real crazy about, you know, the tendencies of the American colonies. And he says, this governor of Pennsylvania says, to disarm the people, that it's the best and most effectual way to enslave them. But when they should, uh, but that they should not do it openly, but weaken them and let them sink gradually. And then Mason says this, I ask, who are the militia? They consist now of the whole people, except a few public officers. But I cannot say who will be the militia of the future day, if that paper on the table gets no alteration. The militia of the future day may not consist of all classes, high and low, and rich and poor. Mason ans answers the two questions that we've asked. Who are the militia? And what is a free state? Who are the militia? The whole people not including public officers. And what is a free state? One where the people are not disarmed, 
and not enslaved. Noah Webster. Noah Webster uh, is a founder of America, the writer of the Webster's Dictionary. He was only 17 when he joined the, the uh, Liberty Resistance, and I think that's amazing. And uh, Noah Webster said this about the Second Amendment, about our right to keep and bear arms. He says, before a standing army can rule, the people must be disarmed, as they are in almost every kingdom in Europe. The supreme power in America cannot enforce unjust laws by the sword because the whole body of the people are armed and constitute a force superior to any band of regular troops that can be, on any pretense, raised in the United States. A force at the command of Congress can execute no laws, but such as the people perceive to be just and constitutional, for the people will possess the power, and jealousy will instantly inspire the people to the inclination to resist the execution of a law which appears to them unjust and oppressive. Who are the militia? The whole body of the people not including the military, not including any force organized by Congress. And what is a free state? One where there is no standing army, and one where the people are armed to resist a government who wants to enforce laws to oppress unjustly the people. So how about that? We've only heard from two framers, and we already know who are the militia, or the whole body of the people, not including government officers, not including the military, not including any force that can be organized by Congress. And the free state is one where the people are not disarmed, one where the people are not uh, under submission to a government under fear, one where there is no standing army, and one where the people can resist with arms a government who wants to invoke and to uh, apply to the people unjust, unconstitutional, and oppressive laws. We have a jealousy to our liberty that should inspire us to resist unjust, oppressive, and unconstitutional laws, and the whole fight behind that is only conducted when the people are armed. Now, every government argument in your courtroom against the individual's right to keep and bear arms hinges on the first four words of the, the uh, Second Amendment. They completely ignore what follows, but every lawyer, government lawyer's argument against your individual right to keep and bear arms hinges on those first four words, a well-regulated militia. And what they try to say is a well-regulated militia can only be a militia that is controlled by the government. Because after all, our framers wrote that it was a well-regulated militia, and everybody knows that nobody regulates as well as the government. Really. <laughs> I know you can laugh out loud, but though the, I'm telling you, that is the argument on paper. Because we probably the only culture in the world that believes that if you look up the word to regulate it, it's somehow synonymous with to govern. A government is supposed to be well regulated so that it is not arbitrary. But everything that is well regulated is not government. A factory worker is well regulated in their action. A well regulated action just simply means you do it the same way all the time without deviation and without error. Our founder, uh, Richard Henry Lee, explains to us what this well-regulated means. He says, whereas to preserve liberty, it is essential that the whole body of the people always possess arms and be taught alike, especially when young, how to use them. See, that's how you get a well-regulated militia. You teach your children from a young age how to use firearms. You teach them in the same way over and over again so that when they grow up, they will know how to use those firearms in a, 
in a organized and regimented, regulated manner. Meaning they're not going to make mistakes. They know exactly how to care for their firearms. They know exactly how to fire them. And there's not going to be any accident. Now, the interesting thing that Richard Henry Lee says is where is to preserve liberty. It's essential that the whole body of the people always possess arms. Lee is answering the two questions for us. Who are the militia and what is a free state? Who are the militia? The whole body of the people. And what is a free state? Where the people always possess arms. Listen to that. To preserve liberty, it's essential that the whole body of the people always possess arms. If something is essential, can you do without it? No. If you're always doing something, is there ever a moment when you're not doing it? Absolutely not. And Richard Henry Lee says, to have a free state, your people, all of them, the whole body of them, must be free to always bear arms, and always do it. So let me me ask you, where is the room for the federal government to impose gun regulations when the essential right to keep and bear arms hinges on the fact that the whole body of the people should always be possessing them? Now here's the problem. We get confused in rights. We get confused in liberty. Someone is now flying off the handle with some ridiculous, irrational uh, rant at the moment, saying, oh, Chris Ann thinks that everybody should keep and bear arms, that we should not uh, be able to, we should allow criminals to keep and bear arms, and felons should keep and bear arms, and, and crazy people should keep and bear arms. We'll explain something to you about liberty. Liberty is not freedom. Liberty is freedom plus morality. And liberty, under natural law, as our framers professed, Benjamin Franklin in 1722, John Locke, uh, Samuel Adams, I mean, uh, uh, Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, they all recognize the understanding, this, this principle of liberty, meaning freedom plus morality. And the principle of natural law says that liberty should know no boundary other than you can harm no other. Liberty should know no boundary other than you cannot take someone else's liberty. And that's where crimes come into place. If you violate someone else's liberty... If you take someone's life and there is no defense of it, then you have forfeited your liberty and forfeited your right. You cannot have a right to keep and bear arms if you are going to deprive someone else of their right unjustly. (laughs) It's ironic, isn't it? The government claims it has a right to keep and bear arms, and yet it unjustly deprives people of their liberty all the time. Complete and total violation of natural law. Should crazy people have guns? I think that if someone is really dangerously and clinically insane, that only due process can prove that. All right, this is Lou Benninger. You're listening to Live with Lou. And uh, today we're doing something a little bit different. I'm, I'm pre-recording these intros, and I'm actually in Saigon or in Cambodia, either place. Uh, and I wanted to introduce a couple items here today that, that we have some helpers with this show. Wikiman is here, Santos Vigil, but Chris Ann Hall is going to be participating, as well as Dinesh D'Souza, with the magic of modern technology. So we're going to play some clips by them and introduce them. But uh, first of all, we're going to play a, a clip by Chris Ann Hall that 
talks about how she got fired uh, working for the uh, state government of Florida by just having uh, giving a speech, and she got canned. So uh, we're also going to talk about today about uh, the 14th Amendment, which talks about the, the proverbial anchor babies, or like what the 14th Amendment meant uh, regarding making slaves citizens, as member slaves weren't citizens. We're going to talk about that. So Chris on Chris Ann Hall is going to get a lot of the lion's share of the show today. Uh, she very graciously agreed to fill in for me. And then also there's a great clip by Dinesh D'Souza. So I uh, hope you enjoy your day. Wikiman's got the controls. So here we go. Rise and shine, liberty-loving patriots. Chris Ann Hall here, K-R-I-S-A-N-N-E-H-A-L-L dot com. Hey, how are you today? <laughs> I'm an educator. I'm a teacher, not a talker. I am not a sensationalist. I am an educator on history. And so that's what we do. Now let me show you some things that we need to really have as a foundational basis. And one of the things that we need to remember is that there are no such thing as constitutional rights. And that's not a supposition, that's a fact. Your rights are not based upon documents or on government's permission. Remember, the, the Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Endowed by their creator, not by documents and not by government. And when we attribute our rights to the Constitution, we admit that those rights come from documents and that the government can alter those rights by altering the document. I mean, that's the whole predicament that we're in today. I am constantly bombarded by by people who are federal supremacists, uh, who have a misunderstanding of liberty and the application of rights, and simply telling me, hey, Chrisanne, this is all great ideology, but you have to balance liberty with security. Well, the balance of liberty and security is that liberty must come first, and everything else follows. And you can't have a balance of liberty and security. You sound like Barack Obama when you say that. Barack Obama said you can't have 100% uh, privacy and 100% security. I'm not looking for 100% security from my government. I am looking for them to preserve the blessings of liberty to to myself and my posterity 100%. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for them to give me 100% security. I can provide my own security in the places that they cannot. And their their need is not security. Their need is power. And when they exercise power over our liberty, then they create us in a place of subjects instead of rulers over government. And so what we need to understand is that our rights are not based on documents. And this is going to be really important because I ne- we're going to discuss something uh, that happened on my Facebook page with this understanding of the 14th Amendment and the understanding of the 19th Amendment. Actually, the understanding of the 15th, 14th and 15th Amendments and the 19th Amendment. And so we're going to uh, lay this foundation that your rights are not based upon a document or on the government's permission. And when we attribute our rights to the Constitution, to this document, we admit that the government can alter our rights by altering the document. Remember, the government has a right, has an, a means by which to alter the Constitution. So think about it this way. Since the Second Amendment is so popular in our minds and, and we get so passionate over it, let's think about this. Do you have a Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms? Or do you have a natural right to do so? Our framers 
made the means for government to amend the Constitution through Article V Convention of the States or by Congress and consent of three-quarters of the states. What if the legislators of the states agreed to change the Constitution? What if they agreed to change the Second Amendment? What if through a convention and ratification of three-quarters of the states, the Second Amendment now reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of the free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms while in government service shall not be infringed. Now, that's not a complete fabrication. That's what... Um, uh, Supreme Court justice wants to change our Constitution to believe. Supreme Court Justice Stevens has proposed that as an amendment to the Constitution. He says, if we're going to have an Article 5 convention, this is my suggestion. And so what if three-quarters of the states agree that the right to keep and bear arms is not an individual right, but a right that belongs to people who work for the government, as long as they're working for the government. Would that legally created amendment to the Constitution then remove the individual right to keep and bear arms? Well, of course not. Because your rights are not yours because of the Constitution. So altering the Constitution does not change those rights. Remember, Samuel Adams wrote in 1772, among the natural rights of the colonists are these, first, life, secondly, liberty, third, property, together with the right to protect and defend them. Your right to protect your life, your liberty, and your property is an inalienable right because they are all uh, surrounding this understanding that you have the right to live, the right to survive. And in order to survive, and in order to preserve your life, you must have the means to preserve your life from all of those who would take it from you. Your right to keep and bear arms is not a Second Amendment right. It is not a constitutional right. It is an inalienable right. Because if you don't have the right to defend yourself, then you have no life, no liberty, or no property. We need to be careful how we speak because it influences how we think. We've been brainwashed into thinking that the Bill of Rights was incorporated into the Constitution to limit the federal government and that federal government is in control of that limit. We must be more diligent in the defense of our rights and the way we perceive them and teach them. And that means that we must be willing to oppose any form of government that would take what is ours by natural law. Remember the Declaration says, quote, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these, these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. We've got to remember our rights don't come from government permission and they don't come from documents. And no matter what the government does to alter that, they cannot change natural law. establishes our right to live as a very basic fundamental right you know I just think about these it should be absolutely offensive some of the things that our government governments do do you know that hunting and fishing licenses should be offensive to us oh well, we wouldn't worry about that because we submit to gun licensing. We're okay with gun licensing. We're okay with our right to keep and bear arms operating by permission of the government. We're okay with that. So it should be within the government's right to uh, make us pay a tax to eat. What if you cannot afford food? What if you live on your land and you cannot afford food? 
What if you go fishing without a license? And that is your only means to eat. You will be arrested. You will be fined. I'm sure maybe you won't be arrested, but you will be given a citation. You will be fined for not paying the government fishing tax. And then you will have to go to court and pay court costs for not paying the government fishing tax. All because you were hungry and you wanted to eat. And the government will say, you don't need to fish to eat. You can give, you can, uh, we will give you what you need if you can't afford it. What if you choose not to be dependent upon the government and a subject in their realm? And you say, no, I prefer to provide for my own means of survival and sustenance. Thank you very much. I don't want government handouts. I will fish and hunt for my food because it is my natural right to exist and sustain my own existence. And the government says, no, you cannot sustain your own existence. You must pay the tax to sustain your existence. And you must rely on us for your existence if you cannot provide that tax fee. Isn't that really offensive when you think about it that way? I mean, it should be. Well, what about the environment and people overfishing? That's why we have to have licenses. Do you know that licenses don't stop people from overfishing? If you want to establish a limit, only the amount that one person can eat, or maybe only the amount that a family can eat, then create that regulation. Don't tax the fishing. Make it a law that you can't overfish, which there already is laws. And then when you find someone in possession of more than he is allowed to possess, making sure that that allowance is reasonable to maintain his sustenance, then you can prosecute him to the extent of the law for violating that law. But you cannot create pre-laws and then call them taxes and fines and punish people for doing things that they have not done as an excuse to create revenue. We are removing the basic foundations of life. The ability of man to provide for his own living. And that should be offensive in the very means of natural law. Why do we do this? Because we have been brainwashed into believing that government gives us rights and that documents are the sources of our rights. It's absolutely ridiculous. Case in point. What brings me to this discussion today? And I will warn you, I may get a little impassioned by this because I found what not just simply what Facebook was doing offensive, but the response of the people to my posts as offensive. I mean... I mean, so offensive that I, I don't really block people. I wanted to block people. And I wanted to think, you know what? Stupid. That level of stupid does not deserve consideration. And so what we need to understand is, number one, that rights don't come from government permission and they don't come from documents. And so Facebook felt the need to post on my page a little picture with my name on it. Happy Women's Equality Day, Chris Ann. On August 26, 1920, women achieved the right to vote in the United States. No, they did not achieve the right. They already had that right. what is stolen from us when we believe that the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote? Do you understand what is stolen from us? What is stolen from our daughters? 
and the servitude that we are placed under when we believe that the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote. Well, first off, we are taught lies then, right? We are taught lies because the 19th Amendment did not give women the right to vote. That is patently incorrect. Women did not get the right to vote from the 19th Amendment. A simple reading of the text tells you this. The, right, the 19th Amendment reads, The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That doesn't establish the legal right to vote. It says the, that that right cannot be denied or abridged, which means the right already exists. This amendment is not giving women the right to vote. It says that that right cannot be taken away. And when we teach the lie that the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote, we teach our daughters that rights come from documents and governments. We deny the truth that women had the right to vote prior to the 19th Amendment and that women actually voted prior to the 19th Amendment. We deny the fact that women were citizens of the United States. We deny that women were business owners and land owners prior to the 19th Amendment. The problem was not the right to vote. The problem was corrupt government denying that right. And Facebook is popular. I'm sure many people saw this meme. My husband said it was popped up on his page as well. Happy Women's Equality Day, Chris Ann. On August 26, 1920, a woman achieved the right to vote in the United States. From all of us at Facebook, thank you to everyone who strive for equality. That is basic government knows best. Government gives liberty and rights propaganda. And it's, it's offensive to me. Now, Facebook has a way to remove offensive pictures. If you find them offensive, you can have them called into question. They will be reviewed, except for this one. Because, you see, they don't give you any criteria to remove a picture because the, fa because the picture is patently false and teaches dangerous, corrupted lies. Lies that will corrupt future generations into believing that rights are, are from document and from government. And so I posted on Facebook a demand that they take it down based on the fact that it's dangerous, that it's a lie. And then explain to Facebook this. Facebook is a medium that relies upon the freedom of speech and press. Believing the 19th Amendment gives women the right to vote is like saying the Bill of Rights gives us freedom of speech and press. Do we believe that, enough people, that if enough people got together and created a law that says we no longer have freedom of speech or press, that those rights would be subsequently removed? Or perhaps this new law would state that women no longer have the right to vote. Would we be bound by that law? Teaching that documents give us rights and that we possess those rights by permission of the government establishes a mentality of slavery to government rule. You know, we ought to be bigger than that. We need to be bigger than teaching our daughters to be slaves, especially when the truth is so much more powerful. The truth and understanding the power our women of history exercised to help America become an exceptional place of liberty. Not the 19th Amendment gives women the right to vote. What a ridiculous assumption. You know, that means that through a convention or, two th or three quarters of the states, that that right to vote could be taken away from women. Or freedom of speech and press could be taken away from all people. Oh, but we already believe that, right? Because now through legislation, not even through amendment to the Constitution, we believe that our right to keep and bear arms is taken away from us, is given to us by permission of the government. You have to file an application now to get a firearm to permission from the government to engage in your inalienable right that shall not be infringed. We're okay with that. That wasn't even a constitutional amendment. 
simply legislation. Oh, but we believe that our freedom of speech and press is also limited by government permission, not by legislation or not by constitutional amendment, by Supreme Court opinion. See, because Supreme Court opinion says that some words are unlawful. How ridiculous is that? No. We've got to shed this mentality of slavery. I have a... a a man on my Facebook page, bless his heart, has just offended me to the utmost extreme. And, and I did restrain myself. I, I, I didn't sort of fly off at the handle like I wanted to. But he tried to tell me that the 19th Amendment recognized that women were a new class <laughs> of citizen. That somehow the 19th Amendment recognized women as a new class of citizen, and then the 19th Amendment gave them the right to vote, this new class of citizen. And this new class of citizen could not be denied their right to vote. New class of citizen. Women in 1920 were received as a new class of citizen are you stinking kidding me do you know how offensive that is to me do you know how offensive that should be to women do you know how uh, offensive that would be to mercy otis warren penelope barker elizabeth king I mean, Abigail Adams, Elizabeth Adams, Hannah Winthrop. How is it that we can look at these women and believe that they were not a class of citizen in their day because somehow the Constitution had not given them the right to vote yet? Because that doesn't happen. They had the right to vote. They had their vote. I mean... Women were voting even prior to the ratification of the Constitution. And these women were not second class citizens. That is progressive historical revision propaganda. And and I and I just I am so offended on behalf of Mercy Otis Warren and the things that she did to procure our liberty. And the women who sacrificed everything for their children and their posterity only to have, here we are in 2015, educated people look back at them and see them as second class citizens. The 14th Amendment did not recognize black men as a new class of citizen either. How ridiculous is that? Do we not understand that freed black slaves voted, owned property, owned their own slaves, were sued, brought lawsuit, were, were recognized in the courts of due process? Just because Dred Scott called them property doesn't mean that's what all the states referred to them as. It's Dred Scott who... Uh, the Dred Supreme Court in Dred Scott, which interpreted the Constitution to declare that people were property. The Constitution did not declare people property. That was the Supreme Court of the United States. As a matter of fact, the Constitution established the mechanisms to end slavery altogether so that we would understand that slavery was an institution that should be abolished and get rid of as a culture offensive to liberty-minded people. But I guess since Abraham Lincoln invented freedom, perhaps Abraham Lincoln also invented this new class of citizen called women. Right? I mean, it's just, 
I, I don't I don't understand. How how do we get to the point where Supreme Court opinions dictate what the Constitution is, but then dictate what we know about history and about people? I d I don't I don't understand how we have operated within this realm of complete and total ignorance and yet maintain such complete and total arrogance. The battle for voting was a state battle. Voter qualification is a power that was reserved to the states. The 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendments were not necessary. As a matter of fact, they were an unlawful expansion of federal power. The battle was to be fought on the state level where the power existed, where the people had the most power. And perhaps if we had kept it on the state level where we would have actually succeeded, we would have succeeded on the state level, then maybe we would have realized that rights belong to people that come from people and not from government. Maybe we would have realized that when we battled to maintain our rights, it's because the rights are ours to begin with. I want to take a quick look at the 14th Amendment because you see, we have been forced into looking at the 14th Amendment from a disproportionate perspective. Uh, we are not taking this from a historical and educational perspective, just from a galvanic reaction perspective, creating a disproportionate view of its actual authority. And so I want to, to suggest to you, and you can ferret this out through your research and the facts, that, the, uh, that I believe wholeheartedly that the 14th Amendment was completely unnecessary and was nothing but political grandstanding. And here is why. Number one, we need to realize that the 14th Amendment has more than one clause. Section one is where we're focusing all our attention, that uh, people born in the United States are citizens of the United States. Section two says that representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their numbers. Section three says that if you were engaged in insurrection, a rebellion against the government, you can't be a member of the government and unless two-thirds of each house agrees that you can be a member of government by permission. And Section 4 says that the uh, federal government's debts to enslave the states was a legal one, and you can't argue with that. And that Section 5 says Congress says that every uh, power to enforce these rests in Congress. Section 1 is not necessary. We did not have to proclaim all people born in the United States were citizens. We were told we had to do this because uh, slaves were not citizens. Well, that was not a declaration by the states. That was a declaration by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in Dred Scott said that slaves are not citizens. To the contrary, the states were operating as if slaves who had been freed were citizens. Freed black slaves uh, were owned property. Freed black slaves owned businesses. Freed black slaves voted. As a matter of fact, freed black slaves owned black slaves. Yes, they did. The first le lawsuit against a slave owner was a lawsuit against a black slave owner owning black slaves because he would not allow them to purchase their own freedom. We did not need to have the second section, which says that uh, representation will be apportioned among the states, that we are told this was to overcome the three-fifths clause, that slave uh, owners can only count three-fifths of their slave population uh, for matters of representation. Well, if you no longer have a slave population, then there's no one to count as three uh, to count as three fifths of the population. You see, we have been brainwashed into believing that the three fifths clause treated black men as three fifths of a person. So we had to have section two to overturn that. That is not true. That is a misappropriation of the Supreme Court's opinion. Black men were not three fifths of a person. Slave owners could only count three fifths of their slave population for representation, so they wouldn't have a disproportionate voice in Congress. And so when we eliminated slavery, 
We eliminated the slave population, which means there is no one that qualifies under the three-fifths clause, which means representation falls in line according to the establishment of the Constitution based on the census. Remember, freedmen are citizens. Unless, of course, you believe the Supreme Court is the ultimate ruler of the universe and that they can overturn the fact that states were already making freed slaves citizens. We also need to remember that slaves were not just black men. Okay? So this is not about blackness. This is about slavery. This is about slaves being treated as citizens, and they had those rights to vote. They had those rights to own property, own businesses, and to even own slaves. And so the entire focus of the 14th Amendment, the entire justification, and relying on one and two, I believe bootstrapped three, four, and five together, was a lie. We didn't need the 14th Amendment to make uh, freed slaves citizens and their children citizens. They already were by most of the states. Once slavery was abolished, then they became citizens upon their free. It was the Supreme Court that said the opposite, not the states. Representation would be apportioned based on the census because there was no more slave population to cause as three-fifths. So reactionary legislation creating confusion, amending the Constitution when it wasn't necessary, creating confusion that allows the people to believe that government gives rights and documents provide our liberty. God bless. See you tomorrow. Have you ever tried to repair your own plumbing problem? It starts with a faucet washer, ends up with an appointment for a permit with the city, and an EPA study to reroute your plumbing through South Carolina. <laughs> or how about the plumber that says, oh, this is going to cost you a little more than I thought. we got seven guys out here on overtime. How about this one? It's going to take a little longer than I expected, so maybe you folks could, like, get a hotel for a while, right? <laughs> that is not a feel-good plumbing experience. Well, it's time to call the plumbing doctor. They charge by the job and not by the hour, and their in-home estimates, they're totally free. They have menu pricing, so you know the true costs right from the start. They have a high-quality line of green products, fully stocked service trucks, and uniform professional technicians. Now that sounds like a feel-good plumbing experience. The Plumbing Doctor, 671-9111, plumbingmd.com. Did you know that Article 4, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution lays out the framework for the state of Jefferson's plan to split California? A state can be formed from the land within another state if the state legislature and Congress approve it with a simple majority vote. 51% is all it takes. Your vote doesn't count in Northern California. California is broken and the time has come for 51. Please visit SOJ51.net and donate now to show your support. Check out the Territorial Dispatch. Papers are weekly and can be obtained free at distribution or by mail through subscription. It's only locally owned and operated newspaper in the region. The paper is the rest of the story. And also check out the E-Territorial. It's an online version of the Territorial Dispatch, which features local news and events for the Yuba Sutter, Calusa, and Nevada County areas. You'll also find daily and breaking news updates, current traffic, and weather information, along with a calendar of local events. Visit the E-Territorial at at eterritorial.com. Rise and shine, liberty loving patriots. Chris Ann Hall here. We, the people, must defend our liberty. And if you cannot define it, you cannot defend it. If you cannot define tyranny, you cannot defeat it. So this week, we are going to start a series. I'm not sure how long it'll take, but we're going to go all the way to the end. And we're going to start a series this week and cover the Declaration of Independence. We are going to go step by step. Walking through the Declaration of Independence, undering, understanding everything within it. You see, if we can 
actually defend liberty, we're going to have to learn how to define it. And Montesquieu, one of the great philosophers that our framers relied upon when creating the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and even the Declaration of Independence. Montesquieu wrote, A nation may lose its liberties in a day and not miss them in a century. We don't want that to happen. We have been losing our liberty over time. Edmund Burke said, The true danger is when liberty is nibbled away for expedience and by part. You see, that's how we have lost our liberty, not in a day, but it's been nibbled away based on promises and plans and necessaries and in little pieces here and there. Well, see, that's not any different than how we started off. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. Well, I think we need to declare the causes. We need to understand what drove our framers to declare independence from Great Britain. In declaring independence from Great Britain, it was not some rogue act of godless rebels. This was a laid out plan. This was a legislative act. And we need to understand what drove our framers to independence so that we can understand what tyranny looks like and we can understand what liberty actually is. So I don't know if you remember the series that we did on Article 5, where every day we took a certain portion of Article 5 and discussed what Congress believes an Article 5 convention will look like. Now remember, it is important to us what the framers said about Article 5. It is important to us what the Constitution says about Article 5. But the interesting thing is, is it important to Congress? because Congress has given the power to call an Article 5 convention. And in that power to call, the Congressional Research Service, the brain of Congress, has created large and expansive measures for Congress to control an Article 5 convention. So in that type of educational series, we are going to now dive into the Declaration of Independence. But you see, we need to understand what drove them to this. Ulysses S. Grant said, too long denial of guaranteed right is sure to lead to revolution, bloody revolution, where the suffering must fall upon the innocent as well as the guilty. Well, Richard Watley said, the best security against revolution is in constant correction of abuses and the introduction of needed improvements. It is the neglect of timely repair that makes rebuilding necessary. You see, we have neglected the timely repairs of our Congress, of our federal government as a whole. And we need to start actually making these improvements making these corrections. Because if we do not, we are headed in a course that will bind and chain our children and force them to actually have to fight for a liberty that's supposed to have been given to us, given by us to our children. You see, when they have to fight... It will not be at the ballot box. When they have to fight, it will be by revolution. We will have left them with no choice. So today, we are going to set the stage. Why did we go to revolution? Was revolution our first step? And what did our framers do to attempt reconciliation? Because, you see, there was great attempt 
to avoid revolution because they understood that a bloody revolution where the suffering falls upon the innocent as well as the guilty is the last resort. We do not want this type of consequence. We do not want this type of solution. We should not be searching for that. And any person who runs and rushes headlong into violence as the solution is doing our children a great disservice. The interesting thing is Thomas Jefferson wrote to Abigail Adams on February 22nd, 1787 and said, The spirit of resistance to government is so valuable on certain occasions that I wish it to be always kept alive. A little rebellion now and then. It's like a storm in the atmosphere, he said. He's not talking about bloody revolution. He's talking about resistance to government in the face of tyrannical laws and, and denial of our liberties. We are supposed to have been resisting the government's imposition of these unconstitutional acts. We are supposed to have been resisting the EPA, the FDA, the Department of Education, the Department of Interior, the Bureau of Land Management. We're supposed to have been resisting all of these unconstitutional measures and unconstitutional agencies. This was our duty as educated and informed citizens. We're supposed to have been teaching our children the understanding that liberty is more important than security, that liberty is more valuable than prosperity. We're supposed to have been teaching our children this, not teaching them that government is the solution to all our problems. And it's because we have become negligent of our duties. It is because we have become negligent in our teaching and understanding of liberty that we've lost that spirit of resistance to government. We, we have developed, quite to the contrary, a, a spirit of submission. Oh, please, federal government, come fill us with all our needs. Come give us what we require. We need you to provide for us. We have turned to our federal government to be as a monarchy, to be as a kingdom, and us as subjects to be taken care of by the federal government. So we need to understand what it took when our framers actually were subjects to a king to remove themselves from that situation. Not so that we can create a revolution, but so that we can define liberty and so that we can defend it. And so we know from our Declaration of Independence that when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, we need to understand that process so that we can make a declaration a declaration of independence from tyranny, not in the manner in which our framers did, but in the manner of taking back control of our government. And so we're going to have to lay out some fundamental basics. We're going to have to learn where we came from. We're going to have to learn about a few things before we actually get into the Declaration of Independence. Fundamental basics about government. When you live in a kingdom, as our framers did, Every right and every privilege comes from the king. And what that means is, is that the king can hand out all the rights and all the privileges. And it also means that he can take them away. Now, Great Britain is a unique kingdom because they have common law and they have, by the time our framers come along, liberty charters. Liberty charters that make certain guarantees to the people of Great Britain, in spite of the fact that the king can hand out all the rights and all the privileges because you see king the kingdom in Great Britain is a unique kingdom it's called a limited monarchy the king does not have absolute whim of the sovereign he is limited by common law 
and by the Liberty Charters. There are some things the king cannot do. And those things were the things that the people established over 700 years to declare their right to liberty, to declare their right, as Thomas Jefferson would say, to the laws of nature and of nature's God. And so we need to understand what it is that they had and what it took for them to stand against a government that was limited. You know, the real genius of what our framers did was that they did not create a monarchy again. They did not create a kingdom because when you live in a kingdom, the only opportunity you have for those corrections, for those corrections, as Burke said, is to revolt, to have revolutions, many revolutions even, and chop off people's heads. But you see, we did not become a kingdom, even though we might look like one now. We did not become a kingdom. We became a constitutional republic. And our remedies are constant. And our remedies. But they're the friend to expansive government. Could it be that they're actually just simply an arm of the progressive government to create opposition? Can you imagine if a Republican president administ or administration, a libertarian president or administration had ordered the mass death of cows and created graves for cows to hide the fact that they had massively murdered cows? Can you imagine the kind of outrage we would be seeing from these animal rights organizations? Why are we not seeing that now? I mean, this is the really big question. What are we dealing with here? Factions and oppressions and, and institutions murdering cows, if I can steal the language of Pitta. You see, this is not about federal government versus private property. This is about theft. Surely the federal government has a grievance with Bundy. But does that give the federal government the right to by force take a man's property and by force murder cows? I mean, really, what kind of government do we live in? One of the liberty charters that our framers had in their possession was a document called the Magna Carta. Now, in light of what's happened on the Bundy Ranch, I want to I want to share with you a section from the Magna Carta. It says, For a trivial offense, a free man shall be fined only in proportion to the degree of his offense, and for a serious offense correspondingly, but not so heavily as to deprive him of his livelihood, and in the same way a merchant shall be spared his merchandise and a husbandman the implements of his husbandry. Do you hear that the purpose of the Magna Carta was to limit the king? The purpose of the Magna Carta was to declare formally and publicly what an evil and oppressive government looked like so that the people would know if their government started to look like that, that they had an evil and oppressive government and that it would be the responsibility of the people to rise up and control that. The Magna Carta would create parliament would create a mechanism for the people through representation to control the government when it gets out of control. But you see, the Magna Carta declared that when a government takes someone's merchandise e and takes the implements of their husbandry, even for a serious offense, that that is an evil and oppressive government. But you see, when we don't know what liberty is, when we don't know what tyranny is, we do not know how to defend and defeat it. We do not understand that what the Bureau of Land Management did was not the right of the federal government. It was a tyrannical act. What is the Bureau of Land Management doing all over this country but nothing but tyrannical acts, violating the very principles of liberty and the laws of nature and of nature's God? And we need to understand this. And that's what we're going to be doing this week. We're going to be understanding where we've come from, what we need to do, and how we need to define liberty and how we need to defeat tyranny. You see, I'm trying to educate so that we don't have to resort to revolution. So let's really, really dig into this. 
Let's get into the meat of what's going on here so we can understand our solutions. Our solutions are great, and the power of the government is under our foot. This week we're starting a series on the Declaration of Independence, and today we are setting the background, the understanding of what it takes to maintain liberty, what it takes to define liberty, and what it takes to control a government. We need to get educated so that we, the people, can maintain the liberty that is, belongs to us, so that we can maintain, as Thomas Jefferson said, equal and separate station which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle us. Our framers were educated on certain principles that simply do not exist in our educational system anymore. I mean, the principles are still there, but we do not teach them. How many have read the complete treatise of John Locke? How about the treatise of Montesquieu? Or of Algernon, for that matter? How many actually know who Montesquieu and Algernon are? I do a man on the street poll and ask people, do you know who Montesquieu is? Can you tell me the purpose of, of one of the treaties of Algernon? Do you know what natural law is? Because that's what one of the treaties of John Locke that our framers studied over and over again to determine what was their best course of action. What were we entitled to do as citizens? Now, don't worry, and, you know, don't let your eyes glaze over. I'm not going to sit and teach the, the treaties on, of Locke and Algernon. But the point I'm trying to make is that if you were to ask the people in the years of 1774 and 1775, if they had read the treatise of Locke, Algernon, or Montesquieu, you know, you, you would find it hard to find someone who had not read them. This was common knowledge in their day. The... Federalist papers and the anti-federalist papers that we find so much trouble reading today. It's only because we lack education, not because they're in Mandarin Chinese. We need to get that education. We need to understand what our liberty is. And we are going to start with a document called Continental Congress Declaration and Resolves. You see, this document was written on the 14th of October, 1774. It was an effort to petition the government of our grievances. Yeah, we didn't invent that fifth aspect of our First Amendment. We came here with that. We, our colonists, had the right to petition the government of their grievances, and any prosecution of those petitions was considered to be unlawful and unconstitutional. Any limitation on those, on that right to petition the government of their grievances was considered unlawful and unconstitutional. Our framers would be completely outraged at the idea that the government would have today free speech zones or free speech areas. That would make them crazy. That... I, the fact that we have allowed that aspect of our liberty to be to go away is just and to be limited like that is it, it would be beyond comprehension of our framers. Well, I want to thank uh, the Yuba Sutter Constitutional Republicans or conservatives uh, for supporting us here. And they've been doing that for quite a while. And remind you that they are meeting on the fourth Thursday of the month. And uh, since I'm on the road, I'm not sure exactly where they're going to be meeting. That meeting will probably be off into December. Uh, and it's towards the very end of December, so we'll be able to give you a heads up on that. But if you have, uh, if you're anxious about that, you can call Tammy Reichard at five three zero seven zero one two eight four five five three zero seven zero one two eight four five. I believe this group uh, 
is going to do their best to hold people accountable, not just suggest who is a good person to vote for year after year, but to hold people accountable and to stand up for conservative principles in the coming uh, months. The other group uh, I want to thank uh, today and appreciate talk about is Elite Universal Security at 5548 Federal Boulevard in Yuba County. <clears throat> and that's Monty Hecker and Monty, uh, former Air Force, uh, and his wife, actually, both of them were in the Air Force, retired, and Monty started this business and now has been very successful in Yuba Sutter counties as well as Butte and up in Shasta County. And Monty... Uh, usually has amazing stories to tell on how he has been approached by businesses with problems, people's getting into our stuff, trashing our dumpster, making a mess, harassing our patrons, uh, using our property as a toilet, et cetera, et cetera, and how he ends up resolving those problems and uh, uh, getting business uh, back back in control. Also, pr- just protecting houses, uh, protecting events, uh, they, they're – they show up at events and, and provide security and, and uh, help to patrons at events. So if you're interested in, in that type of service, you can call at 749-0280. They also will hire you. Uh, they're looking for good employees, and they work up and down the valley. So maybe you're in Butte County or farther up or Sutter or Yuba, they, but they are looking for workers. So if, uh, some of you I know out in Oliver and Linda, you're hiding. You don't want to go to work, and so you're you're uh, ab- absconding and uh, trying to avoid uh, taking a job. You'd rather just get it. You know, a lot of people just get used to getting free money from the government, so they don't want to end that. But if you want a job, you want to learn the guard business, and maybe you want to work your way into law enforcement, it's a good way to do it. You can start at 749-0280. Call them up, 749-0280. You can actually go on their website at EliteUniversalSecurity.com, EliteUniversalSecurity.com, or API-Academy.com, and find out what's shaking there, what classes they have coming up. You can call them, you can text them, you can do all kinds of stuff, and uh, find out what's shaking, and whether you want to just take a class out of personal benefit, like a concealed weapon permit class, whether you need a live scan, they have lots of services. They're a 24-hour operation out there. So uh, check them out. We really appreciate their help, and thank you very much. So we'll get back to the show now. Rise and shine, liberty-loving patriots. Remember, this week we are doing a study on the Declaration of Independence. And what we learned yesterday was that we did not go to war against our own country. It was not a foreign war with Great Britain. There were no Americans in the Revolutionary War. We were British people fighting our British government. The Revolutionary War was is a bit of a misnomer in itself. We did not revolt against the government. It was the government revolting against our liberty. The framers and the patriots in our uh, country were simply trying to restore the liberty that had been bought by their ancestors through 700 years of battles and negotiating with kings. But we also learned that we did not go to war with our own country over taxes. It was not about taxes. It was about mandated purchases. It was about legislation without representation. It was about a denial of due process. It was about a central government that declared that it could make a law that would bind the people in all cases whatsoever. I will give you some proof for that. Alexander Hamilton wrote in a piece that he called A Full Vindication on December 15th of 1774. I want you to catch these dates, 1774, because you see, again, we are discussing the Declaration of Independence, and we are establishing the historical proof that the Declaration of Independence was not a movement by a bunch of rogue, godless rebels. This was a legislative act by a Continental Congress, a movement of the people that had been well in place before 1776, a people who attempted in their very best efforts to prevent violence, to prevent war, to prevent a battle, but they could not 
because it was the government that became violent against them. H uh, Hamilton says on December 15, 1774, But some people try to make you believe we are disputing about the foolish trifles of threepence duty upon tea. They may as well tell you that black is white. Surely you can judge for yourselves. Is a dispute whether the Parliament of Great Britain shall make what laws and impose what taxes they please upon us or not? I say, is this a dispute about threepence duty upon tea? The man that affirms it deserves to be laughed at. It is true we are denying to pay the duty upon tea, but it is not for the value of the thing itself. It is because we cannot submit to that without acknowledging the principle upon which it is founded. And that principle is a right to tax us in all cases whatsoever. May I remind you that the whole argument against the Health Care Act from the very beginning was the fact that if the government can force us to pay uh, for health insurance, if the government can force us to buy health insurance, then there is nothing that the government cannot force us to buy. I am stunned and amazed as we progress through these days that this argument has dissipated into the air of nothingness. We now argue about penalties and about coverage and about losing jobs, and we don't really stick to the fundamental truth that this is still the fundamental truth, that if the government can force us to buy health insurance, there is nothing they cannot force us to buy. And as Ma Hamilton is saying here so eloquently, we are, we should not be refusing to pay the penalties, refusing to purchase health care simply because the value of the thing. It is because you cannot submit to the Health Care Act without acknowledging the principle on which it is founded. And that principle is that the government has a right to force on us all purchases and all mandates in all cases whatsoever. This opens a door that we do not want to walk through. This opens the door to an unlimited and all-powerful federal government, a government that is not limited by the Constitution, is not limited by the people, but stands in front of us completely and totally unlimited stands in front of us whose only limitation is its own will and not the Constitution and the will of the people is that the kind of government that you want is that the kind of government that you want to leave to your children is that the kind of government that we should just simply go along to get along May I simply repeat the words of Alexander Hamilton from this very same writing, a full vindication. He says, Is it not better, I ask, to suffer a few present inconveniences than to put yourselves in the way of losing everything that is precious? Your lives, your property, your religion are all at stake. May I remind you that this is the entire embodiment of the Health Care Act. Your lives, your property, and your religion are all at stake if we simply and peacefully submit to this health care act. I'm not telling you you should be violent, but I'm telling you you should not go along to get along. You should not be trying to comply with this law because this law will bind you in all cases whatsoever. And then Hamilton says, I do my duty. I warn you of danger. I am trying to do that as well, Mr. Hamilton. I am trying to warn the people of this country of the danger that you taught them about in 1774. He says, if you should still be so mad as to bring destruction upon yourselves, if you still neglect what you owe God and man, you cannot plead ignorance in your excuse. Hamilton saying, look, you cannot claim to me that you did not know the truth because I'm standing here right in front of you and I'm telling you the truth. And you have to jump over me to believe lies. May I submit to you, dear Liberty First listeners, 
that I endeavor to give you the truth and I am posting the truth every single day. I am sending it out on my website. I am preaching it on the radio waves. I am posting it on Facebook. I am tweeting it in the Twitter world. There will be no excuses. There'll be no excuses that there were no warnings. Because I have done my best. Now, my name is not Glenn Beck. My name is not Sarah Palin. And my name is not David Barton. I do not have the reach that they do, but I have their reach through you. You are my reach. And frankly, I am still absolutely and totally stunned that we are not hearing the things that I am warning you about from Beck and Barton and Palin. Because remember, your lives, your property, your religion are all at stake. And I have given you the fundamental proof based in history, based in fact, based in law. But apparently, these warnings are not worthy of being professed by those in the mainstream. And I don't understand that. But again, I warn you of danger. And if you would still be so mad as to bring destruction upon yourselves... If you still neglect what you owe to God and man, you cannot plead ignorance in your case, Hamilton says. Your consciences will be, your consciences will reproach you for your folly, and your children's children will curse you. Is that the fate that you want for our history? See, that's why I'm doing this lesson on the Declaration of Independence. Because, you see, there is so much to be learned through history. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know no way to judge the future but by the past. It's about time we pick up the warnings of men of real wisdom, not men and women in black robes who think they know more about the Constitution than the men who wrote it. Not men and women who we've elected, who know absolutely nothing about the Constitution, and if they do, have proven that they do not have the mental fortitude, the integrity, the wisdom, and the courage to stand for what is right. They're more worried about standing for what is politically correct and politically advantageous. It is about time that we shut these people up. It is about time that we send them home. It is about time that we defund them and stop providing them with the money that is being used to persecute us and steal our liberty. It's about time that we pick up the wisdom of our history and learn what our future is going to look like if we stand by and do not heed these warnings. It's about time that we defend the liberty that belongs to our children. And we cannot do that while we remain ignorant. And so in this Declaration of Independence, when it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separate. We should be declaring the causes which compel us and impel us to separate from from these wicked, selfish politicians and wicked, selfish judges on the bench. These are not my words, by the way. These are the words of Thomas Paine. He says, and what is a Tory? Good God, what is he? I should not be afraid to go with a hundred Whigs against a thousand Tories where they attempt to get into arms. He says, every Tory is a coward. For servile, slavish, self-interest fear is the foundation for Toryism. How do we know that our government is nothing more than a bunch of Tories? Well, Ma Thomas Paine tells us, I once felt all that kind of anger which a man ought to feel against the mean principles that are held by the Tories. A noted one who kept a tavern at Amboy was standing at his door with as pretty a child in his hand about eight or nine years old as ever I saw. And after speaking his mind freely, as he thought prudent, he would finish with an unfatherly expression. Come back after this break, and I'll explain to you how our government is nothing but a bunch of Tories. 
independence and we're digging in and digging out some stumps because I am not doing this series so that you will understand the Declaration of Independence. I am doing this series so that we can pick up that lamp of history and learn from our past and avoid the fate that we are driving towards through our ignorance. It's about time that we understand that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and we don't have to figure out what we're to do next. History has laid out the path before us and we simply need to learn from the mistakes of our past and make improvements against a federal government who wants to bind us in all cases whatsoever. Let me remind you to download my mobile app at your iPhone store and your Android store so that you can keep up with this series. As soon as the podcasts are posted, they will be available to you. We are broadcasted all over the country on multiple stations. Please look into this and see where you can find us. And download the app and share the series because this is invaluable. Now we left off last break with declaring that our federal government and our politicians are nothing but a bunch of Tories. And it was Thomas Paine who called the Tories just exactly what they are. He said that Tories are cowards. He called them cowards. Servile, slavish, self-interested who fear is the foundation of what they do. Our federal government, our politicians are Tories today. The entire mechanism that they use to rule over us is fear. Fear is the entire foundation for what they do. that we understand that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and we don't have to figure out what we're to do next. History has laid out the path before us and we simply need to learn from the mistakes of our past and make improvements against a federal government who wants to bind us in all cases whatsoever. Let me remind you to download my mobile app at your iPhone store and your Android store so that you can keep up with this series. As soon as the podcasts are posted, they will be available to you. To Thomas Paine, that's the trait of a selfish, wicked parent. Someone who says, this is the best we can do in today's political climate means this is the best I can do to maintain your peace today. I am too much of a coward. I am too selfish to actually stand for what is right and what is true. And I am too selfish and self-interested to say, if there be trouble, let it be in my day so that my child may have peace. And what we do through our trading of liberty for security, what we do for our trading of liberty for prosperity, because we've got to have that budget, we can't have another actual shutdown because then our favorite party might be damaged in reputation. But you see, we're not worried about our favorite party being damaged in reputation by us indicating that we are cowards and selfish because they would most clearly rather put our children in harm's way then step up and do what's right. Yes, I am still giving you a lesson on the Declaration of Independence and its meaning. We are still studying why we went to war. You see, this is hermeneutics. This is the understanding of why what is written is written and not the blind ignorance pulling from the shallow pool we call the Supreme Court and government. Dinesh D'Souza at our table this morning to discuss his new book and political documentary with the same name, Death of a Nation, Plantation Politics and the Making of the Democratic Party. What motivated you to write this book? Well, uh, I think it's motivated by the crazy political times we live in. It seems to me that the atmosphere since Trump's election has been almost surreal. Uh, I'm a product of the Reagan era. 
And uh, it's very clear that we don't live in that era of gentlemen's politics. Politics has become rougher, more savage, less civil. And incendiary accusations flying all over the place. Trump is a racist. Trump is a fascist. Uh, and not just Trump. These accusations are aimed more broadly at Republicans, conservatives on the right and the right. And so this book steps back and basically um, says, wait a minute. Uh, let's zoom in and examine the history of bigotry all the way from the beginning to the present in America and ask whether this racist and fascist tale belongs on the Republican elephant, as is often alleged, or on the Democratic donkey. You tweeted uh, yesterday, the left-wing critics can only bash my book and movie by misrepresenting them. No dummies. I'm not, no dummies. I'm not saying Hitler was a liberal Democrat. Why did you tweet that out? Because uh, of a Washington Post article that basically says, hey, Dinesh claims that Hitler was a liberal. Now, this is a flat-out misrepresentation of what I, say, what I say. What I say in the movie is actually much simpler and more crushing and factual. I say that Hitler and the Nazis got three specific ideas, destructive, genocidal ideas, either from American progressives or from the Democratic Party. Uh, one, uh, the, uh, Hitler was inspired by the Jacksonian Democrats of the 19th century. He said, Ju just the way that they displaced the American Indians and took their land, I'm going to displace the Poles, the Slavs, the Russians, and take their land. So he explicitly drew from the democratic example of the 19th century. A second example, we show this in the movie, the senior Nazis who made the Nuremberg Laws, the laws that made Jews into second-class citizens, while they were making those laws, they had in their hand the democratic laws of the Jim Crow South. They had them. And they basically crossed out the word black, wrote in the word Jew, and they were off to the races. So I'm not just saying that the democratic laws and the Nazi laws are parallel. I'm saying the Nazis got it from the Democrats. Now, this is not in our textbooks. It's not on the History Channel. We don't hear about it. This is how progressive history has suppressed inconvenient facts that connect the Nazis to American Democrats and American progressives. So it's not as crude as Hitler was a liberal. I wouldn't say that. But what I am saying is Hitler actually, the Nazis were inspired in some of their concrete policies by American progressives and American Democrats, and that's a fact. And why do you feel the need to, to write that and make a movie. Because think about it, when today people use words like fascist and they don't even know what they're talking about. Uh, they say things like Trump is a fascist because he was a nationalist. Now anyone with any glimpse of history or with my kind of background knows, wait a minute, Gandhi, uh, my countryman, was a nationalist. Mandela was a nationalist. Fidel Castro was a nationalist. Abraham Lincoln was a nationalist. So if nationalism equals fascism, all these people would be fascists. But that's nuts. So clearly that's not what fascism means. So I think if we're going to use these terms, and I don't mind using them, you have to do a bit of a deep dive into who were the fascists? What did they believe? So the reason I open up the history is the history illuminates the meaning of terms like fascism. What is your background? Well, my background is I, I, I'm a first-generation immigrant. I came to America at the age of 17, $500 in my pocket. Uh, I went to Dartmouth. Uh, then I studied at Princeton. Uh, I was a, a scholar at the Reagan. I was a, a policy analyst in the Reagan White House, a scholar at AEI, and then for seven years a scholar at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. So it's kind of funny because you get all these sort of historians go, well, Dinesh just doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, the truth of the matter is, you know, Dinesh is a revisionist. That's the big thing. And I, and I am, in a sense, but what I am revising is progressive revisionism. Because the progressives have told a story about American history. And that story is rigged to leave out inconvenient facts which have been suppressed. I'm just bringing those out. So, and this is both in the area of fascism and racism. So in the area of racism, we hear things like the party switched sides. The Republicans became Democrats. You know, Nixon's Southern strategy brought the Dixiecrats over to the Republican side. Not true. Not true. And I can document it. So I, I do it in very simple ways. Let's list all the Dixiecrats. There are about 200 of them. These are people who joined the Dixiecrat Party in the 40s, or they voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. A whole bunch of senators, a whole bunch of congressmen. Now let's count how many of the racist Dixiecrats became Republicans. Answer out of 200, two. One in the Senate, Strom Thurmond. One in the House, Albert Watson. And no others. Now, a historian at Princeton takes me to task. He goes, what about Trent Lott? What about Jesse Helms? Uh, what about John Tower? 
Well, those weren't Dixiecrats. So if you want to change the game, I'm happy to talk about it, but don't pretend like you're refuting me by giving straw man examples. Well, here is Jonathan Tobin, who's the editor, uh, Tobin, who's the editor in chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, um, writing in uh, Haaretz a column about your film. He says, it is true that the Democratic Party was the political shield of slavery and Jim Crow racism, but that tells us nothing about contemporary Democrats. There was a collectivist uh, aspect to the ideology of the Nazis, who did call themselves national socialists. The left's belief in government power also has elements of compulsion and prioritized social justice over individual liberty that can sometimes echo the perils of past utopian movements that evolved into murderous totalitarianism. But to essentially label Hitler a liberal is historically illiterate as well as deeply offensive. The problem goes beyond the way he debases the mention of the Holocaust. Today's Democrats are not Nazis any more than they are Confederates. Right. So this, this was a very intelligent commentary until it dropped its straw man at the end. And the straw man at the, man at the end was Dinesh claims that Hitler is a liberal. I do not claim that. Nowhere do I write that. You could never find a statement by, by me saying that. And why, why wouldn't you say that? Because, see, first of all, liberalism itself is a term that is metamorphosed. The original meaning of liberalism is liberty. That's the meaning of the word liberal. And the American founders were liberal. They believed in economic liberty, uh, political liberty, liberty of thought and expression. In that sense, classical liberalism, I'm a liberal. I'm a liberal in that sense. Now, modern liberalism has changed. It doesn't quite mean that. But modern liberalism essentially is the ideology of the welfare state. Now, it is true that if you read the Nazi 25-point platform, the economic dimension of that does affirm welfare state principles. State control of banks, state control of education, state control of healthcare. You go down the list, it's eerily similar. But obviously the Nazis had a racial ideology that was built into that. And I'm not claiming that the Democrats share that in in a kind of, I'm not equating the two. What I'm really doing when I list the Nazi platform is I'm basically saying, When you read this Nazi platform, is Nazism on the right, as we've all learned, or does it sound a lot like it's on the left? That's the issue I'm actually arguing about. And when you say platform, you're referring to an economic platform? No, I'm referring to the political platform in which the Nazis came to power. Remember that when Hitler was made chancellor in 1933, the Nazis were, in by election, the largest party in Germany. So what did they campaign on? What was their platform? There it is. They lay it out. We show it on the screen in the movie. And so it's very, history is illuminating because in some senses, we, when we think today of Nazism, we only think about the Holocaust, the gas chambers, and that was 1945. But we also have to go back to early Nazism. Why did people find it appealing in the first place? And the answer was it was a collectivist ideology that was in a sense of a peace with progressivism. The progressives in America and the fascists in Italy and the Nazis in Germany recognized each other as on the same side of the aisle, the left. We'll get to calls right after this, but you were going to finish your thought about this criticism by Jonathan Tobin saying, you, you start out calling it, it was an intelligent review. Right, because he began by saying, yes, you know, the Nazis were collectivists. Hitler was a national socialist. Uh, the Nazi platform was a socialist platform. It was not on the right, as we've often led to believe. So what he's What he's touching on, but he doesn't say, is that after World War II, the progressives who were coming to power in academia and the media, they knew the inconvenient leftism of Nazi ideology, but they didn't like it because they didn't want to be linked with them. So they began to sort of muddy the waters and try to move fascism from the left-wing column, where it always was, into the right-wing column so that they could now pin it on their political adversaries. That was what I call the big lie. Let's get to calls. George, Hudson, Florida, Republican. Hi, George. Good morning. How are you doing, Greta? By the way, Greta, you are the best moderator on C-SPAN. Thank you, George. Appreciate that. Um, I've got to ask, uh, Denise, I, I'm on Twitter. I've been on Twitter since 2008, March of 2008. I've got 5,000 followers, and every time I turn around, I'm losing followers. I don't know what it is about the shadow banning. I've got a good handle that anybody could uh, could um, understand or uh, catch on to. It's Pasco, P-A-S-C-O, on Twitter. But I can't get any followers. And it's just, uh, it's, I think it's because I'm conservative. I'm, I, I follow Dinesh all the time. Everything he has to say, I, I, re, I retweet everything he does, among other things, with uh uh, all the other conservatives, you know, Hannity and all the others. And I just can't understand how it's going to happen, how I can't get the followers that I want or I need that I, is being a conservative. And it's horrible. I, it's just horrible 
even I'm always fighting for it. Okay. My other question to Dinesh is, how have the people been treating you since you were arrested and convicted, which is a, a big joke? How have they, since uh, Trump has uh, pardoned you, how have people been treating you? The other the other side and the conservatives. Uh, are you doing well? I hope so. I, I like I, I follow you every, everywhere that you go, and I think you're great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, the pardon was fantastic. It was exhilarating, uh, not just because I could now vote again and, um, and, uh, and own a gun, uh, but really because uh, it gave me my American dream back. Uh, it kind of lifted the felon label that the left had sort of hung on me. Uh, so I'm thrilled about it. Uh, look, I mean, there's, there's an argument about the, all this. I remember when I went on CNN right after the pardon, uh, they were like, well, gee, Dinesh, you got favorable treatment because some very powerful people like Senator Ted Cruz and President Trump uh, got you off. Uh, and I, my reaction to that was, well, some very powerful people named Obama and Eric Holder uh, got me in the first place, so it took some powerful people to get me and some equally powerful people to get me off. And what, what were you convicted of? I was convicted of exceeding the campaign finance law by giving money to a college friend of mine who was running for the Senate. Now, look, this is an issue of equity. I did exceed the campaign finance law, so I should get whatever penalty other people get who did that. But... The problem is that no person in American history has ever been prosecuted, let alone convicted or locked up for doing what I did. Recently, Rosie O'Donnell admitted that she exceeded the campaign finance law on five occasions. Now, she did it out of, you know, may say, leftist enthusiasm. But in theory, there are five attorney, uh, U.S. attorneys who could file charges, but none of them have talked about it. Why? This is not the kind of case that is normally prosecuted. But if you make a movie upsetting the most powerful man in the world, I guess I should have expected the empire to strike back. And the movie, for those that don't remember or don't recall it? Uh, that movie was called 2016 Obama's America. came out in 2012. My first documentary film, The New One, Death of a Nation, my fourth. We'll go to Jay here in Washington, D.C., Democrat. Thank you so much for uh, taking my call. I got a question for your guest, Mr. D'Souza. Your complete comprehensive definition of fascism and include a contemporary example, please. I'll hang up and listen. So uh, Mussolini uh, is the founder of fascism. He started the first fascist regime in the world. Uh, Mussolini, Mussolini described fascism this way, everything in the state and nothing outside the state. And what this means is that the state, the federal government, has full control of the economy and also of the lives of citizens. So this was the collective root of fascism. Mussolini, of course, was a Marxist. He was a lifelong socialist. Uh, Hitler was the head of the National Socialist Party. Now, you asked me to apply that to the contemporary situation. So fascism today is on the left in three ways. Uh, the first, I would say Antifa. Look at these guys. They wear black costumes like Mussolini's black shirts. They go out on campus. They beat people up who don't agree with them. Uh, that's a fascist tactic. Uh, number two, uh, what happened under Obama? Government control of the banks, of investment companies, of healthcare companies, the whole healthcare sector, every hospital, every hospice, increasingly government control of energy and education. So state run capitalism. Look it up. That's the clinical economic definition of fascism. And third and finally, the use of the weapons of the government against your political opponents. If you use the FBI, the CIA, the IRS, the DOJ against your political enemies, if you try to merge your party with the state, that's what Mussolini did in Italy, and that's what Hitler did in Germany. The Nazi party became the state. Brooke Park, Ohio, Maryland, a Democrat. Uh, yes, I'm just curious. Um, when you came to this country, can I ask you, how did your education get paid for? Well, it is a, a, one of the great things about this country that... Um, that uh, particularly uh, Ivy League institutions have a policy, and it's a policy to this present day, that if you are smart enough to get in, they will find a way for you to get, have enough money for you to go. Uh, I had absolutely no funds to pay for my education, so Dartmouth gave me a combination of grants, uh, loans, which I paid back over eight or ten years after I graduated, and work study. So this is a typical way in which students who can't afford to go to college uh, are able to sometimes, uh, through merit or through need, uh, get a combination of grants and loans that enable them to go. So I'm eternally grateful to Dartmouth for making that possible uh, and to America for making it possible. Marilyn? Okay, but see how you're biting the, the hand that fed you, though? Because you're sitting there calling America now 
a fascist that believe in conservatism. I mean, they want conservatism. Now you're you're saying that they're not, but they don't believe in education and grants and those kind of things. Did you ever realize that? Uh, well, first of all, that's complete nonsense. I wrote a book a few years ago called What's So Great About America? I've been defending intelligent patriotism in this country for 25 years, so I'm not anti-American in any way. Second of all, Dartmouth's a private institution. That money that paid for my grants was donated by alumni. We're not talking, I didn't get one penny of federal funds. I didn't get st uh, Pell Grants or any of that. So there's nothing inconsistent in supporting private philanthropy uh, and using private philanthropy to support education. Now, with regard to Trump, uh, we did something uh, provocative. We put Trump and Lincoln and morphed their heads in our movie poster for Death of a Nation. And some people do a double take. They go, what the, how, how, how can you do that? Well, I'm not saying that Trump is Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln was brooding. He was philosophical. He was melancholy. Uh, and that's not Trump. Uh, but their situations are kind of similar. In 1860, an outsider, a Republican, was elected president in a very close race. Uh, and the moment that he got in, uh, all hell broke loose. Uh, the Northern Democrats, some of them were openly calling for his assassination, which actually happened eventually. The Southern Democrats were so unwilling to abide by a Lincoln presidency that they were willing to break up the country. So there was a lot of craziness going on around Lincoln in 1860, and there's a lot of craziness going on in America today. Uh, a Republican president, Trump, an outsider, w comes in, and essentially we've been living in abnormal politics for one simple reason, and that is that the Democratic left cannot accept the result of a lawful election. All this th stuff about Trump being a fascist, Trump being a white supremacist, is essentially aimed at the media left trying to say, we get to trump the result of the election. It doesn't matter what the American people decide. Trump is like Hitler circa 1933, and whatever means that we use to inject him and get him out of there are fine. How do you respond to people when they point to what happened in Charlottesville and that the president would not, um, that the, the president said there were bad people on both sides? Well, this is really, I would say, the, the Trump card, if I can use that term in our movie, because I have uncovered an aspect of Charlottesville that is not in the public debate, and that is the whole point of Charlottesville. There was a tragedy in Charlottesville, and, and, and that won't change. Uh, somebody was run over and killed, and so it was a tragic event in that sense. What I'm contesting is the meaning of that event, because from the left's point of view, this was right-wing white supremacy. And that was the whole point for Trump to condemn it. These are right-wing white supremacists. I deny that. I deny that. And I deny it now based upon a close analysis of who was there and who these white supremacists are. Now, in this book, Death of a Nation, I go through the list. Jason Kessler, the founder of, the organizer of Charlottesville turns out to be an Obama activist and an Occupy Wall Street guy. Now think about this. Does it make any sense that someone who's an Obama voter and supporter becomes a white supremacist? That makes no sense to me. So you think the media would be like, let's check this guy out, right? Well, there was a Charlottesville paper that did. It looked into his background. Turns out he has a long left-wing history. They interview his girlfriend, and she goes, he broke up with me because I'm too conservative. This guy, Jason Kessler. Now we move on to the poster boy of white supremacy, Richard Spencer. This guy is so controversial when he went to speak in Florida, the governor declared a state of emergency. So I interview him in the film and it's, it's riveting. It's about four minutes in the movie. And I ask him a series of questions, very illuminating. I ask him, for example, does he believe that all men are created equal? No. I say, does he believe in individual dignity? No. Does he believe in the right to life? No. Where do rights come from? He says, well, they don't come from God. So well, where do they come from? He goes, they come from the government. So he's a statist. He believes the government gives you your rights. Then I ask him, what do you think of Reagan? He goes, terrible president. I go, who are your favorite presidents? He lists a bunch of Democrats. And I go, well, those are all Democrats. He goes, yeah, I know. He goes, but it's just a party. And he's naming people like Andrew Jackson, who was the founder of the Democratic Party. The point I'm trying to make is that the white supremacists are not conservative. They're not conservative in the modern American sense of conservative. They're unrecognizable to a normal conservative, and that's obvious from the movie. So what I'm doing really is through a combination of history, investigative journalism, contesting these prevailing narratives, but I'm doing it in a responsible and civil way. My only objection to what the left does to the movie is you have all these critics, and I wish they would, look, look, I'm releasing a movie in a thousand theaters. Greta, if this was a normal America, I would be on Good Morning America, I'd be on CNN, uh, I would be on The View, I'd be debating these topics. But as of this date, as far as ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, CNN, MSNBC are concerned, this movie does not exist. They will not say one word about it. They're pretending like if they don't cover it, it's not a fact in the world. 
I find this appalling. This is what I mean by abnormal politics. Because you're in a thousand theaters? Uh, because no. that's some sort of bench benchmark? I don't know. Well, I mean, think of it this way. Yeah. Michael Moore is about to release a movie in a month. It's going to be in about a thousand theaters. Uh, my movie, I've made four movies. My last four movies are all in the top ten political movies of all time. So, in a sense, I'm on the conservative side. Moore's on the leftist side. The moment he releases a movie, there's an ocean of publicity because he is, in a sense, you may say, on the politically correct side of things. And all I'm saying is... I'm demanding a right to be considered and for my views to be debated. I'm not, demand, I'm not saying I have a right to be cut. I'm, I have a right to be on CNN. No, I'm just saying if the ideas here are worth debating, let's debate them. Go to Jim in Florida, Independent. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, some uh, comments, and uh, I like your response. I'll, I'll go through them pretty quick. Uh, I'd like you to talk about being a political prisoner and Tommy Robinson being a political prisoner. And I, and I like your opinion on the globalists ain't going to let this happen again. They're going to pull out. They're going to pull out every stop on this next this next election. Uh, they they, they got to remember that what they did with Trump with this collusion thing wasn't necessarily for if he won. It was to shut him up afterwards. They're trying to demonetize a lot of people on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. And they'll get the compl they'll get the compliant Democratic left to go along with them. Don't forget, Bella Asbug already tried to plan a coup against Nixon by taking out the vice president. Also, and I just think that we need to devote more time to what is the contingency when these globalists do take over. Where are we going to assemble in mass? Because they will not allow us to be to be able to communicate with each other. And we got miles to go before we sleep, sir. Please, good luck. Thank you. Bye. Well, you know, I've never called myself a political prisoner. It's kind of a strong term. But what I do say is, you know, when I speak on campus, people say, well, Dinesh, what makes you think that the Obama administration went after you? You know, you made a stupid movie, and how do you know you even saw your movie? Well, the reason I think that is because when I released the movie in the theater, and remember, that movie was in 2,000 theaters, I was being regularly attacked on a website called BarackObama.com. That's the president's personal website. So I'm reasonable in thinking that somebody up there was upset by my film. Uh, second, uh, when the FBI developed a file on me and a congressional committee got a hold of my file, they see in there that it's red flagged, Dinesh is a right-wing conservative. Now see, that shouldn't be in my file, because the whole point is that people who violate the law should be treated the same. It, their politics are irrelevant, but the reason that the FBI put that in there is to alert the Justice Department, hey, this is a guy you may want to go after. You know, and that's the thing that troubles me is that when justice is manipulated so that the, the scales are tipped. Who told you that, who from a congressional committee told you that this was in your file? So what happened was once the Republicans got, a, got control of Congress, uh, the, a congressional committee asked the Obama administration to give me the file. The usual nonsense from the FBI. Confidential sources, we can't give you the file. So finally they, give you, they gave the congressional committee the redacted file. And a congressman who saw that file called me and he goes, number one, your case is a $20,000 violation, but the FBI immediately assigned $100,000 to investigate your case. He said, that's extremely abnormal. So all this rubbish is going on behind closed doors. And now I see it in a bigger scale with Trump. Same thing, the uh, FBI trying to tip the scales, and this is very worrying. I mean, look, the FBI has had a history, but even when J. Edgar Hoover was doing his crazy business taping Martin Luther King, he wouldn't dream of trying to tip the scale of a presidential election. Can you tell us who that member of Congress was? Uh, yeah, it's Ron DeSantis in Florida. <clears throat> and as, what happened next? Uh, so uh, I'm just saying the, uh, so the, co the, con the Congressional Committee was aware that something is fishy in my case. Here's another indication. Uh, Judge uh, Berman in uh, New York, a Clinton appointee, as part of my sentence, he sentences me to mandatory psychiatric re-education. Think about this. I gave money to a college friend running for office. Does this require psychiatric examination? There, there was a government-appointed psychiatrist in California. When I went to see her, she looked at my case, and she told me after one hour of consultation, she goes, you do not need psychiatric counseling. I'm going to write this judge and tell him that he's a loon. And so she wrote him and told him, this man does not need psychiatric education. And the judge said, I'm forcing you to do it anyway. And so I went through a year of this, at the end of which she basically said, I'm not doing this anymore. And the judge threw up his hands and said, OK, let's stop it now. But this is the kind of craziness that I've been living through. So you can understand why my politics have become a little bit more uh, fierce. I lived in an idealistic America where I'm like, this is, these are the Republicans, these are the Democrats. They believe this, we be as if it was a big debate. But now I actually see the deeper human motives of envy and revenge also play a role in the political process. And so that now influences the way I see the world. 
Franklin, North Carolina. Crystal, a Republican. Thanks for waiting. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. D'Souza. You don't know it, but I've been listening to you for a long time. I'm 43 right now. I went to Western Carolina University in my mid-30s, and that's where I started learning about stuff. Uh, up until then, I didn't know a lot of uh, definitions of things, and and I really appreciate your research on things, and I just think you're wonderful. We need more people like you. Let me catch my breath, because mm-hmm. this is the highlight of my day. Mm-hmm. Hold on a minute. Anyway, uh, the lady that talked about where your money came from with the education, I'm a veteran, and I think it's wonderful that our country paid for your education. I went to school with so many young people that were just squandering it and wasting it, and I don't know. Uh, it's just a shame. It's a really hard thing to uh, try and fix, you know. Um, the only thing that I can bring it back to is its simplest form. I'm a mom now, so I have to teach my kids a simple way to understand all this crap that's going on. It's really the no better term for it. But I learned the political scale in college, and I think that the political scale should be taught in high school because nobody knows who's who. I mean, there is a left and a right. Why? Uh, There is a center. Why? Well, I think that that is just so undermentioned in everything that we do. And I love what you do. I love all your movies. I just, I love you so much. You're awesome. Have a great life and I'm right behind you. So this is the kind of person I write my books and make movies for because, you know, it's funny, I used to inhabit a more rarefied kind of intellectual climate and there are some people who say, to to this day, it's really too bad that Dinesh left the intellectual reservation, he went populist and so on. Part of my problem was essentially the intellectual world is a cocoon. Uh, I was initially writing to persuade, you may say, well-meaning guys on the left uh, who were scratching their head in 1983, and they're still scratching their head. Uh, and they'll be scratching their head 10 years from now. So at some point I realized, look, I don't mind talking to that group, but there's a vast group of people out there who want to learn. And these people didn't make, maybe go to Ivy League schools, but they want to know about the American founding. They want to know about the Civil War. And I would like to bring what I know and my experience, being born in a different culture, this kind of unique perspective I bring to America, and try to reach those people. And that's why I made the shift. I'm still writing the books, but I now often will convert them into movies because a movie appeals not just to the head but to the heart. Uh, it engages all the senses, and it reaches an audience that you, you're not going to find in a book signing line at Barnes & Noble. Let's go to David. Flint, Michigan, Democrat. Uh, good morning. Um, I noticed C-SPAN have this guy on here a lot, this Soda guy. He's all, that's the second time I've seen him in about three months, I think. But anyway, um, he mentioned Michael Moore. Uh, we love Michael Moore and Flint. We're proud for, for him being from Flint, and he tells the truth, and he's one of the greatest. And also, I'm a I'm Obama supporter. I appreciate the things he did. And one thing I can say about Obama, at least as he was when he was president, he represented black, white, everybody, a melting pot, not just one race of the country. I'm a taxpayer, and I'm offended that my money's going for somebody that don't like me being in this country and from my my uh, my parents my uh, ancestors were slaves here I don't I, I don't like the fact that the conservatives don't like us being here and, and David d- just just before we have mr. D'Souza respond why do you believe that why do I believe what the, uh, that that the president doesn't want you here well um, out of all the judges he's picked and from what's come, from what I've been told, none are black. He put all these federal judges on, not one black. Look, I'm a taxpayer. I pay federal. I pay taxes. I work two jobs. None. I'm not being represented by nobody that looks like me. And also, this guy, the soda. If if he was in Arizona. Uh, that sheriff of power would have had him arrested because he favors the South Americans. And and if you go by race, like a lot of the people that support Trump, you would probably been arrested and jailed before they knew who you were. Well, see, I think this is really a, an unfortunate um, 
uh, distortion here because the line that Trump has consistently drawn is between the legal and the illegal uh, immigrant. Now, if all the legals were white and all the illegals were non-white, a suspicion of racism would legitimately creep in. But the fact of the matter is the vast majority of people who are legal immigrants are non-white. They come from Asia, from Africa, from South America. So that shows you that the line that Trump is drawing is, is not a racial line at all. Uh, it's rather a line between citizens who are part of a social compact and other people who are coming here unlawfully. Now, it's important to realize that illegal immigrants are offending not just native-born citizens, but they're also offending legal immigrants like me. It would, took a long, complicated process to, to sort of go through the line. And basically, there are a lot of Indians who want to come to America, but they can't swim across a river or jump across a fence. They've got to stand, you may say, in line. And the illegal immigrant is cutting the line. So I find it amazing that the Democratic Party has become an open advocate for illegal immigration. This is actually an insult to all legal immigrants in the United States. We heard from Ivanka Trump yesterday saying, that one of the low points of um, being at the White House thus far has been the issue of separating children at, at the border. <clears throat> I mean, she went on to say she understands, you know, that this is an issue of legality as well. Do you think it was a mistake by this administration to separate the children at the border? Well, I think it's a human tragedy, for sure. I think this, this the very, uh, but it's important to realize how does a tragedy occur? I mean, the, the problem is that when you have a, a system that is porous like ours, a, a border that's porous, it gives people the idea that, gee, you know, if I come across the border with my kids, uh, then they're going to have a life in America. So the, I understand the motive. But then the problem becomes if you get caught, pleasure.